I'm Philip Barter from Sydney, Australia, and uh, with me is Ron Krauss from uh, UCSF in the United States. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the problems that occur with abdominal obesity. Uh, it's growing recognition that abdominal obesity is driving a new worldwide epidemic of cardiovascular disease. And we're just beginning to understand why this is occurring. One of the major factors that's contributing are abnormalities of blood fats, of cholesterol, triglyceride. And uh, Ron, tell us uh, a little bit about some of the lipid abnormalities. Sure. Uh, uh, there's a condition that accompanies uh, abdominal adiposity that's been called atherogenic dyslipidemia. Uh, now that term really signifies uh, a collection of lipid uh, traits. Uh, that include high triglyceride and low HDL cholesterol, which are really the mainstays of this dyslipidemia. Uh, but there's also abnormalities in uh, LDL, which is the main particle in the blood that uh, winds up in the arteries and causes atherosclerosis. Uh, and so these uh, conditions tend to come together. Uh, and uh, the form of LDL that appears to be most dangerous in this condition is actually a small dense LDL particle that is not commonly measured, but it tends to go along with high triglyceride and low HDL. So by measuring triglyceride and HDL cholesterol, which are standard measurements, uh, one can get a, a picture of the uh, severe atherogenic dyslipidemia that uh, is the basis for cardiovascular disease risk uh, in uh, patients with abdominal obesity. And, and in fact, most people with abdominal obesity will have this problem of small, dense LDL. What's, what's bad about the small, dense LDL? Uh, well, you know, LDL particles uh, wind up in the artery wall, uh, and uh, they cause damage uh, through a number of uh, effects on the artery wall, including uh, their ability to stick into the artery uh, and get oxidized. And these small LDL particles that occur uh, in uh, abdominal obesity have a greater tendency to stick to the artery and to become uh, more rapidly oxidized. Uh, and uh, this is often under the surface, that we don't recognize this when we measure LDL cholesterol, which is the more common uh, way that we assess uh, cholesterol in the blood, uh, because LDL cholesterol levels are often normal, uh, despite the fact that there's an increased number of LDL particles. And that's because these particles actually, while they're more dangerous than other forms of LDL, uh, actually have somewhat less cholesterol. So, uh, it's important to recognize that even in patients with abdominal obesity who have normal uh, LDL cholesterol, uh, there is likely this underlying uh, pathology of LDL particles that creates uh, high risk and should really be uh, part of the goal of improving abdominal adiposity should be to normalize this uh, lipid profile in these uh, abnormal particles. And so we can be reasonably confident that if somebody has abdominal obesity right. and these small, dense, atherogenic LDL particles, if they can lose that abdominal fat, right. they can correct the problem. Yeah, you know, it's, very, uh, it's very important to recognize that this is reversible. Uh, there's a strong genetic component uh, to this condition, but it's really susceptibility, like many of the other things that we see with abnormal adiposity. Uh, uh, what can uh, bring out uh, an inherited susceptibility by uh, the wrong kinds of behaviors. Uh, and that includes, uh, in the case of small LDL, uh, increased amounts of, uh, of carbohydrates, particularly uh, sugars, that tend to drive a lot of the features of abdominal adiposity that are uh, detrimental to health, uh, including this dyslipidemia. So by limiting carbohydrates and simple sugars in particular, and uh, sugary drinks, as uh, I think we know have many uh, adverse effects. This can improve this lipid profile significantly. Okay. So, so tell us about HDL. Well, the other aspect of the dyslipidemia associated with abdominal obesity is having a low level of HDL cholesterol. This is a fraction that does not cause atherosclerosis and it may actually protect against atherosclerosis. But again, the HDL particles are smaller they are less likely to protect. We know that normal HDL, not only does it have the ability to take cholesterol out of the artery wall and promote regression of atherosclerosis, but HDL also has the ability to inhibit inflammation in the artery, it's antioxidant, it's antithrombotic, it even promotes the repair of artery walls that have been damaged. There's a lot of controversy about HDL at the moment, 
and that's related to the HDL cholesterol concentration. What we really need is HDL function. And there's evidence that people with abdominal obesity have HDL which don't function as effectively as normal. Reduce the abdominal fat and there's evidence that the HDL becomes functional again and increases in concentration. So what we have is this combination of LDL particles that Ron was talking about that are more likely to cause atherosclerosis, especially the small dense particles, and HDL that is decreased in concentration and not as functional as it ought to be. And one important uh, aspect of this is that these abnormalities travel together. Uh, and, and one can achieve a, a, a tremendous benefit on this whole profile simply by adopting the healthy lifestyle practices that we've talked about throughout this uh, meeting. Uh, increased physical activity, uh, to try to maintain uh, a healthy uh, balanced diet, uh, specifically trying to eliminate carbohydrates and, and uh, sugary drinks, uh, can improve the whole profile together. Uh, I think from the standpoint of evaluating uh, both uh, the risk associated with this dyslipidemia and the improvements that one hopes to achieve, uh, one can uh, adopt some fairly simple measurements um, uh, beyond LDL cholesterol, which as I said doesn't necessarily capture uh, the risk associated with, uh, with the LDL particles uh, without necessarily measuring uh, the individual fractions. And one way of doing that uh, is measuring uh, apoprotein B, uh, which is uh, uh, often available as a standard test. Uh, that measures the number of uh, LDL particles that uh, is a very good marker for risk. Another test is non-HDL cholesterol, which is uh, calculated uh, as the difference between total and HDL cholesterol. And so these are ways of uh, uh, diving into the, uh, into the serious uh, lipid disor disorder here uh, uh, without necessarily having to do uh, all these sophisticated tests, but uh, uh, recognizing that LDL cholesterol itself may not really be the, uh, the, the most important measurement in these yeah. patients. One, one of the things that has complicated this is people argue, is it the HDL, low HDL that's the problem? Is it the small dense LDL? Is it the high triglyceride? And this really unnecessarily confuses and complicates it. It's the combination. People who have a high triglyceride, a small dense LDL fraction, and a low HDL concentration all of which associate with abdominal obesity, it's the total picture. And we know that if we can get rid of the abdominal fat, all of these abnormalities correct themselves. And so the dyslipidemia, it's a futile argument to worry, is it this, is it that, is it this? The real question is, and we know the answer, it's the combination. So with that, our target should be to get rid of the abdominal yeah, fat. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, that, 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 that takes care of uh, uh, the whole lipid package plus many other uh, risk factors for heart disease and diabetes. And that way we can perhaps reverse what is an alarming increase in an epidemic of cardiovascular disease that is driven by abdominal obesity. Mm -hmm.